Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center, The Danger of Not Maturing, with John Lomaking. Hello and welcome. This is another segment of this series, Anchors of Truth, and in this week, you are hearing about the danger zone, and this uh, first message was the danger of neglect, the second, the danger of unbelief, tonight. The danger of not maturing. The danger of not maturing. The speaker is one that is well known to our 3ABN viewers, but perhaps those of you at home, maybe it's the first time you hear Pastor John Lomakang. And I will tell you, this is a person that uh, had not the Lord said, John Lomakang, this is the way, walk ye in it. Tonight he would be at another place perhaps, not in the ways of the Lord, but the Lord rescued him. And as it was in the days of the disciples, said to him something similar, come and I will make you a fisher of men. And he gave his heart to the Lord and he's been preaching the gospel, not only by preaching, but also singing. So he preaches in different ways, living his life, uh, singing, and also preaching. And so the Lord has selected him. He has prayed much, studied much, and he's about to come out soon so that the Lord will use him to bring his message to the world through Three Angels Broadcasting Network. And people watch us in different ways. And local TV uh, channel, if you're watching and you are blessed, please tell us how you are watching the program and what channel it is, if it's a local channel, if it's a cable channel, we want to know that you are blessed by these programs, and we want to uh, encourage the speakers that come on 3ABN, and we want to know if the message helped you in some way, so that we may continue to do this for the honor and glory of God's name, and to continue to bless God's children all over the world. Again, the message is the danger of not maturing. Before we continue, we'd like to invite you to pray. Those of you uh, at home, those of you that may be in prison or in a hospital, we invite you to pray with us. Uh, after the prayer, we are going to have a musical offering by Sister Celestine Berry, a song that communicates a message. People need the Lord. Before that, we're going to pray, so we ask everyone here to please stand. So together, let us approach God's throne of grace. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all you do for us. And now, Lord, you have called us, called us to listen to this message. We pray, Lord, that you will speak to us from your throne of grace through your servant, Pastor John Lomakang. We pray that once again you will bless him and fill him with the Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. Help us to understand this message that could be a warning for us. We ask you, Father, to bless everyone that is here and everyone that watches all over the world. We ask you for these things. In Jesus' holy and blessed name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. We leave you with Sister Celestine Barry. And right after that, we will hear the preaching of God's word in the voice of Pastor John Loman King. May God bless you.
Thank you, Celestine. Amen. As uh, someone said earlier, she's not just my secretary, but she's also a singer. And uh, I said, I get two things for the price of one. But thank the Lord for that message tonight. Um, normally, Mike would be playing. Mike, her husband, he's a wonderful musician, but he's a little under the weather tonight, so do keep him in prayer, uh, working out in this warm, hot, sticky southern Illinois weather can really take its toll on you. And, uh, but thank you for that message because the sermon fits along the lines of how much we all need the Lord. We've started with the danger of neglect, then the danger of unbelief. Tonight, the danger of not maturing. Let's go before the Lord as we open the word together. Father in heaven, tonight is an opportunity once again for humanity to fill, for divinity to fill humanity. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you will subdue my thoughts, that they will be in harmony with your thoughts, and that your people will hear the message that you intend. In Jesus' name, amen. The danger of not maturing. There are two more topics, the danger of drawing back, and then finally tomorrow afternoon, the danger of refusing God. As I pointed out briefly last night, in the Christian life, if you begin at the end of these topics and go in the opposite direction, you begin to see what you need to do to get closer to the Lord. You reverse those things. You don't reject God, you accept Him. You don't draw back, you draw to Him. 
You, you, you strengthen your maturity. You strengthen your belief. And then you choose not to neglect, and then you're a strong Christian. But as we began with neglect and unbelief, the very next stage after unbelief is you failed to mature. Let me begin by sharing a story. Because the fact of the matter is everything created is either growing or dying. Whether animate or inanimate, growth is essential to the existence of everything alive. When I lived in California, remember that very well, we were living in Antioch, California at the time, and we had a wonderful kitchen. The, the kitchen sink was where most wives would want it, right by a window. She can look outside while washing the dishes. Uh, for some reason, my wife wanted that, and the Lord blessed us with a home that had that. Uh, one day I was looking by the sink where she kept her plants and I saw this small, little, very thin green branch. It was just so small, I thought to myself, it really wouldn't make any sense. She's got the whole large plant. Keep that, let's throw this out. And as I was walking toward the, toward the garbage can uh, and I leaned forward, my wife said, don't you throw my plant out. And I said, honey, this is not a plant. There's the plant right there. This is... I don't know what this is, but this is not a plant. She said, yes, it is. Which says to me, we may not at times look like there is any life in us, but anything that God creates, he inserts in that life. What do you say? It doesn't look like it all the time, but if you give it a chance to grow, it'll grow. So what happened? I have to tell you the rest of the story. My wife took a little paper cup and she put it on the sink Little, little foam cup, and she put some water in there, not enough to drown it, put it on the sink. And every day I went to the sink, I looked at that cup with frustration and disgust. I thought, this is ridiculous. She's got a big old plant, and here she is with this little whatever it is. And a couple of days goes by, she'd pour the water out, put new water in. And would you know it, after a few months, that thing began sprouting. And a few months down the road, she was able to give someone a brand new plant from that little tiny twig that I was about to throw away. I want to begin by saying we've got to be careful when we talk about maturing because some people grow differently than we do. We don't know where they are in their stages of maturity. We may be a full-grown plant, and they could be a fledgling looking like there's no life in them, but if we connect them to the source of life, they will grow. In the growth of the Christian, there is no rest area in the stages of growth. We are either growing or we're dying. There is no dismissal from the process of growth. When you become a Christian, Either you're connected to Christ to continue growing or you cease to grow. There is no such thing as a stagnant stage. There is no neutral lane where we wait to grow. We are either growing or we are dying. Furthermore, it is not possible to be a Christian and not grow. Your claim to Christianity can only be verified by examining what grows. Now, you think about that. If you look at the church uh, people are growing, but where they're growing is really the question. What they're growing in is really the question. I've seen parents sometimes uh, in the store, and, and I get frustrated when I see children yelling at their parents because I know what would happen if it were me. At least I knew what happened when I was growing up. I couldn't point my finger and yell at my parent without some kind of immediate public result. Amen? But there are children nowadays, and, and I've heard parents say, oh, they'll grow out of it. There is no such thing as growing out of evil. You've got to train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old, after that whole length, lengthy process of training, then they won't depart from it. But you don't naturally, there's no such thing as a natural heart growing away from evil, which is a natural tendency. That's why how we grow can only be verified by looking at the source of someone's nourishment. I mean, consider the analogy further. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 to 18. And for those of you tuning in, it's going to be on the screen. The Bible says, You will know them by their, together, fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Well, the answer is naturally no. Even so... Every good tree bears what kind of fruit? Good fruit, but a bad tree, bad fruit. A good tree, and this is the law of growth, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. 
This is an amazing concept. Years ago when I was reading a book called uh, The Life of Victory, the author by the name of Mead McGuire, a post-19th century writer, just at the turn of the century, he said, we are either growing or we're dying. There is no such thing as being connected to a good source producing bad fruit or being connected to a bad source producing good fruit. You've heard the phrase, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. If you don't get rid of that bad apple, just a matter of time, it's going to spoil all the fruit that are around it, including oranges if they're in proximity. But there's no such thing as a bad tree producing good fruit. And there is no such thing, think about this, as a stagnant Christian connection. If we are stagnant, the reason is we are disconnected. Because any connection to Christ produces growth. And I suggest any connection to Christ produces good growth. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. In order to produce, in order to produce fruit, we must be connected to the source of life. John 14, verse 4 and 5. John 15, verse 4 and 5. The Lord says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And here he goes on. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears how much fruit? Much fruit. For without me you can do how much? You can do nothing. I've had sometimes to speak to relatives that have members of their family that are not Christians. And they say to me, I don't know why they don't straighten up. And then they say, I don't know how long it's going to be before they do right. And then I ask the question, are they Christians? They say, no. And then they say, well, they should know better. And I said, even if they intellectually know better, they cannot produce anything until they are connected to Christ. You cannot produce good fruit if you're a bad tree. you got to cut down the bad tree, get rid of the bad tree, and get connected, grafted in to the vine. Get con grafted in to Christ. Only as you're grafted in and connected to Christ can anything good begin to be produced in our lives. So if you have relatives that are not Christians, don't think because they're intellectual or because they're educated or because they're adults that they naturally should do good. There is no good outside of Christ. None at all. When we come to Christ, when you think about the stages, and what I'm going to begin with as I get toward not maturing or talking about the danger of not maturing, I want to begin with the process of, of growth. What does it really mean to be a Christian? You see, when we come to Christ, when we accept Christ in our lives, when we come to Him, before that change, we are not qualified to produce anything spiritual until we sever our connection from the natural. In, Matthew, in Romans chapter 7, I remember a number of years ago, I did a series on 3ABN. Oh, this is way back, maybe 2005 or 2004. And um, when I showed my program outline to, to production, actually, bless her heart, Molly Steens, and I showed it to her. And one of my sermon titles was, Kill Your Husband. And she said, John, that's too strong for our audience. <laughs> she said, you got to change the title. And I said, well, if you read Romans chapter 7, it says um, the woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And God was talking about the spiritual connection. She said, well, you got to change the title. That's just too strong. And I preached that in church and I said, I want you to know this is not a suggestion. <laughs> so the title was Till Death Do Us Part. And the fact of the matter is we are all born married to this old nature Romans 6 calls it the old man of sin. And so until that old man of sin is put to death, there's no way that we could be married to Christ. You can't marry another man until the man that you were married to in the Bible spiritually is dead. When he's dead, the Lord said, now you're free to marry another man. And then as you marry that other man and you connect intimately, then the fruit begin to show up. We've got to have an intimate connection with Christ for the fruit to show up. But when we come into that relationship, we have to understand what that means. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. Look what it means to sever the natural connection. Romans 8 and verse 5. The Bible says, For those who live according to the flesh 
set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Depending on how you live, it determines what you focus on. I've talked about that. If you live a natural life, you focus on the natural things. You focus on the things of the world. But if you live a spiritual life, you have developed an appetite for spiritual things. That's why sometimes when you see people that they don't have an appetite for the Bible, I can guarantee you they're living in the natural. If they don't have an appetite for spiritual things, they are not connected to the spiritual source because there's no way that you can be connected to the vine and not produce what's flowing through the vine that is through Jesus. Remember, he said, without me, you can't do anything. If you are connected to me, you produce much fruit. But without me, you can't do anything. And even the desire, even the desire to be spiritual cannot occur unless we are connected to the vine. The severing of that natural connection is called death. The act of death is symbolized by a burial service. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. The burial service. The Bible says about this burial service. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his what? That we were baptized into his death. In other words, one of the distortions of baptism is that it has been distilled down to nothing more than church membership. I've had people approach me and say, what do I need to do to become a member of your church? And we walk them through, you know, the fundamental classes and we say that. But um, I thought about that today and I said, you know, we need to change the title of our baptismal class to something called making funeral arrangements. <laughs> Put your head around that. Making funeral arrangements. Because then we'll begin to tell people what really, what Christianity is really all about. You can't enter that new life until you come to the realization that you've got to die. Until you say, I, you, you can't even, you, you can't be connected to a new source until the old source is dead. And until we acknowledge that we need to die, we won't understand why we need Christ to live the new life. I was reading a book, that very same book, and I, I appreciate it so much. Matter of fact, it's one of my, I, I read that book so much that the binding fell apart. I had to take it for them to give me a new binding at one of those Kinko stores. Now they put a spiral binding. But I remember reading a statement, and this is so interesting about the new life. The author said, can we live naturally at sea? And I thought, what a ridiculous analogy. I can't live naturally at sea. I'm not a fish. I could stick my head under the water, but I will be coming up pretty quickly. Anybody, can you say amen to that? We will be coming up pretty quickly. But he said, he said, we can live at sea as long as our source of life comes from somewhere else. And then he used the deep sea diver as an analogy. You know, deep sea divers, you remember years ago, I don't know if you see them much nowadays, at least I haven't, but remember years ago, deep sea divers, before we had all this advanced technology, they used to have this long hose. Remember that? This long hose from the boat. And you knew where they were because you just have to follow the other end of the rope. But you also knew that if anything happened to that hose, they're in trouble. Illustrating if we don't stay connected to Christ in an environment that is not natural to us, we'll die. And what we got to come to the realization of is the spiritual environment is not natural to the human environment. Let me restate that. The spiritual environment is not natural to the carnal man. Think about that. Even when we're born again, we still have to struggle every day with this old fleshy body. That's why we are looking forward to the day when we will put on the new man. Amen, somebody? One day this body that has all that bad storage, the, as the, the, the hard drive needs to be defragged, there needs to be a new insert, which is not going to happen until Jesus comes. We'll get that incorruptible drive. Until then, we've got to maintain a day-by-day -day connection or else we will die. The Christian life requires the death of the natural man and the birth of the spiritual man. To be a Christian, we need a completely new life, as we often say on January 1 or, or December 31st at midnight, out with the old, in with the, in with the new. Look at Romans 6 and verse 4. It illustrates that very clearly. Out with the old, in with the new. Notice what it says. 
Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the, together, newness of life. When you think about that, if we have entered into this relationship with Christ, this thing called the new life, we have to keep in mind that the new life for Jesus, follow this, his new life began post-Calvary. Think about that. When he said, all power is given unto me, even though he is, and I never use Jesus in the past tense because he always is, I am. Even though when he came and condescended, he is the Son of God, he came in human form, and the flesh he had before the cross was susceptible to temptation. That's why the devil stalked him all his life. But because he never gave in, because he said, the prince of this world has come and he has nothing in me, he survived. And on the other side of the cross, then he declared, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Which means... Post the cross, there's something waiting for us that we don't get pre the cross. Look at Galatians 2 verse 20. There's something waiting for us on the other side of this crucifixion that we don't get until the crucifixion. Galatians 2 verse 20. The Bible says, I have been crucified with whom? With Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Notice the source is somewhere else. And the life which I now live in the flesh, that's this simple body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can the church say amen? I have been crucified with Christ. You see, that's where life is all about. Until you begin at Calvary, let's look at this. You got to begin at Calvary. Then you got to go into another condition. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Before the, before the resurrection morning, before the newness of life, you got to begin at Calvary, the place of death. And one of the reasons why a lot of Christians don't mature is because they really haven't died. They became church members. They just became church members. They've accepted the 28 fundamentals, which you can't argue with. Amen. And they become church members. So they are dead, <laughs> dead church members. Don't take that personally. But, you, but in order to be alive, you, in order to have this resurrected life, you have to first die. you got to be crucified with Christ. You can't do it apart from Him. And Jesus illustrated that how hopeless and helpless the old life is in accomplishing the requirements of the new life. Look at John chapter 3. What He said to a man by the name of Nicodemus. John chapter 3, look at verse 6 to 7. He said clearly in this, in this nighttime conversation, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is what? Spirit. Do not marvel at this that I say to you, you must be born again. If you break that down today in common vernacular, Jesus said, don't be surprised that you need to die. Don't be surprised that you need to be born again. And this wealthy man, this Nicodemus, this ruler, this guy that had it all in society, he came to Jesus by night. I want to make a point about that. It's better to come to Jesus by night than not to come to Jesus at all. He came by night and he found light. I heard on a commercial recently, they said, even a faint candle could be noticed at 10 miles away by the naked human eye. No matter how faint your light is, the Lord will allow that light to shine in the darkest night. But what concerns me about this text when it compares the spirit and the flesh, there's this philosophy nowadays that's going around, this philosophy that I'm locked to a particular lifestyle because I was born this way. Have you heard that? You know, see, you know, the reason I'm this way is because I was born this way. But that's the reason why Jesus said you must be born again. Amen, somebody. No matter how you're born, no matter what neighborhood you are raised in, you must be born again. No matter what society approves of, we must be born again. Regardless of your parental or your sibling uh, influence, we all must be born again. So we can't even claim that, well, you know, I've got this gene. Well, I agree with you. 
I agree with that whole genetic disposition to sin because the Bible says we're all born in sin, shaping in iniquity. It just depends on what you choose as your sin of choice. Regardless of what it is, we all must be born again. There is an out. There is no need to die in what we're in. We can find our out in Jesus. Amen. Now let's take this to the next level. You're born again, you're baptized. The baby has been safely delivered. They're no longer in the amniotic fluid, which I call the water in the baptismal pool. The umbilical cord has been cut, meaning from now on, the baby's survival is completely dependent on getting nourishment from a different source. Are you following me? I know the parents, I know the moms are right with me. After the new birth, the baby's first feeding comes. Now I'm going to the level of maturity. Baby hasn't had its first bottle. Baby hasn't had its first input of source after it was born. Post the natal care, the, the cord is cut. Mama ain't giving it anything intravenously any longer. It now has to be fed a different way. I suggest to you that stuffing solid food into the baby's mouth as a first meal will be met by the inability to break it down. Mother, say amen. If you keep giving a new baby solid food, the baby's inability to handle that solid food will result in malnutrition and then eventually a premature death. Meaning, when you're born again, your diet can't be the same as your mother. It's got to start off on a different level. I'd like to explain why I believe baby Christians don't survive. They associate, now I'm getting back to the analogy, a baby Christian doesn't mean a baby physically. But some reasons why baby Christians don't survive is they often associate their physical maturity with their spiritual maturity. They think that because they're adults chronologically that they are also adults spiritually. And what happens? I've had that. I had some people said, you know, they joined the church when they're 35 or 40. I had a couple walk in here. They were in their 70s. And they said, well, how old is too old to be baptized? And I said, it's never too old to be baptized as long as you're alive. Amen, church? But you cannot associate a person maybe in their 60s or 70s or God forbid if he gives them more than that time, 80s or maybe 90s, you cannot associate their physical maturity with spiritual maturity. It's not the same. One is chronological, the other is spiritual. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is what? Spirit. You've got to keep those two separate. But one of the reasons why they don't mature is they stop feeding. When they stop feeding, things begin to go wrong. They don't know what's wrong, but something is. Whenever you stop feeding a baby, they start making noise. Here's what they do. The baby starts crying and gets restless and irritable. And no matter what you do, you can't relieve that baby's discomfort. At that point, any sensible parent would take that baby to a doctor. Can I get an amen somewhere? Now they're at the doctor's office. There's a point to this story. I don't have any children, but I've learned this by reading books. Help me out, somebody. <laughs> At the doctor, the, the, the doctor listens to the baby's heartbeat and checks the baby's breathing patterns and discovers that its heart is out of rhythm and its oxygen levels are low. I need to make the spiritual application right here before you get lost. You see, brothers and sisters, when your heart is out of rhythm with God and your oxygen level, meaning you're lacking the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you got to pray the prayer of David. Here it is. And what is that prayer? Create in me a what? Clean heart, O God, and renew a what? Right spirit within me. I suggest that some of the reasons why Christians are always crying and restless and irritable is because they have stopped feeding somewhere. And they're missing the assurance that comes by that connection to Christ. Well, let's go to the next level. 
The doctor writes another prescription for the crying, for the constant restlessness, for the irritability and the complaining. If you're constantly restless and you're irritable and you're complaining and you don't know what's going on, you need this prescription. Psalms 51 and verse 12, the Bible says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. What do you say? Some people need that because they're not feeding themselves. And when they get weak, all those symptoms show up. You wonder why church members are sometimes so irritable? I can guarantee you they're not feeding. Or I can guarantee you the other side of that, they may have run into somebody that's trying to stuff solid food down their throat and they're not ready to digest that. Which happens sometimes. I remember, I remember in one of my former churches uh, rebuking one of my elders. You know, somebody just came to church, they just got baptized a few weeks earlier, and they brought what they could to fellowship lunch. And you know, people try to do their best, at least that's my analogy. They brought what they could to fellowship lunch, and, and they put their dish on the table, and one of my elders that had been eating solid food, it appeared that way for many years, I thought he would have been more mature than that, but in his solid food mode, he came to this baby Christian who just joined the church a few weeks earlier and said, is there any pork in that? And they didn't even know the answer. Uh, it's beans, not sure. Sometimes we could make babies that are new suffer from indigestion if we try to stuff all of our solid food spiritually into their lives. Can you say amen to that? We've got to give them room to grow. We've got to give them room to develop. We've got to give them time. Sometimes the doctor concludes that the baby's diet and the symptoms will eventually vanish. But I tell you, symptoms don't vanish naturally unless there is some input to relieve those symptoms that we suffer from. Peter the Apostle suggests what we need to do. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. The Apostle Paul talks about the baby's formula for spiritual maturity. Here it is, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 3. Notice it on the screen. He says, and this is amazing. He says, and he's talking about the irritability here. He says, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. That's what happens with newborn babes. Sometimes they don't get rid of that stuff quickly enough. And then he says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, or as the King James Version says, that the Lord is good. We often translate that or transcribe that. We often say, taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you said that before? But you got to taste. You got to know that. And some, sometimes baby Christians die a spiritually premature death because they ingest things that prevent their growth. They focus on things that rob them of their spiritual nourishment. That's why, go back to the verse again and look at verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. I want you to see verse 1 just very quickly. Lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. You can take that off the screen now. You know, when we come to Christ, sometimes those things are two weeks behind us. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If you just came to the church, you just gave your life to Christ, but you haven't forgotten how to envy. You haven't forgotten what it's like to be a person filled with malice. You haven't forgotten hypocrisy and all those things that went along with your former life. Matter of fact, I was giving a Bible class at another one of the churches I pastored in the Northern California Conference. And in my class that particular day, the conference president was there. And when he came in, I, I asked the, the, the group to turn to a particular scripture and they couldn't find it. And he said, oh, I am so excited. They can't find the book of Matthew. He said, that means we got some newborn babes in here. Amen. And then he went outside and he walked past the exit of, the, of my office door and he smelled smoke. He said, oh, that smells so good. That means there's somebody here looking for Jesus. Amen, church. So you can't let those things irritate you. You can't let those symbols and signs of the old life as they peel away, you can't let that interrupt your flow. If you're an adult, let the babies grow. Come on, say amen. Let the babies grow. But also as you grow, to focus on the things that have no spiritual nourishment leaves little energy to spend on things that facilitate growth. When the Bible says desire, 
You got to think about a baby. As a baby, when a baby desires, he stretches out his arms to reach his bottle. You know, we have to stretch out our arms during the week to reach God's Word and study it. The Bible can't walk to us. We've got to stretch out our arms to study the Word of God. What do you say? We've got to put some effort in that. And when we realize that the Word of God is good, it's like giving the baby candy for the very first time. You know, from that point on, when a baby tastes candy, they're hooked. Matter of fact, I, 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 I've seen this happen in church, and I, I didn't know what it was all about until I realized uh, you can give a baby a piece of candy, and they get used to the sound of the wrapper. Have you noticed that? When you open that first piece of candy and you give it to them, they hear like, you know what I'm talking about? I can't do that very well. I need a cellophane lip to do that. But that week they enjoy that piece of candy, but I guarantee you the next Sabbath, you can be sitting across the aisle, and, you, and that sound happens, and that baby that can't even say a single word goes, Shoo. they know exactly where that candy is. Amen? They get used to the sound. Because they know associated with that sound is something sweet. My point is this. David the psalmist wrote in Psalms 119 and verse 103, if you spend time in God's word, you'll discover it's addicting. Notice what he says. Psalms 119 verse 103. He says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You got to study God's word. You got to study God's word to find out how sweet it really is. It is sweet, but it's, it's not something we do naturally. We've got to put effort into that. I've often said to people, study God's word and make it a homework assignment. If you make it an assignment like schoolwork, because we don't like schoolwork, if you make it an assignment like schoolwork, you'll eventually develop an appetite for it. But now let me flip the script. Don't expect baby Christians to behave like adult Christians. Don't expect baby Christians to walk like adult Christians. Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. Notice this. You've got to give them time to get there. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11, Paul says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. Give them time to change their speeches. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, what did I do together? I Put away childish things. I, I could count how many times, you know, some members that have joined our church that went to other churches, they'd say, see you next Sunday. Am I telling the truth? See you next Sunday. Oh, uh, sorry. I forgot. You got to give them time for all that vernacular to change. You got to give them that time for all those things that we say and we've got all the acronyms, you know, the the ADRA, the, you know, the, all the things we say. We know what 1844 is. We have all of our you know, SDA and all those acronyms that to the new baby, it's just nothing but gibberish. We've got to give them room to grow. We've got to give them room to grow. Don't stress out babies by expecting in a few months what has taken you years to develop. Amen? Now, let me flip the script. I talked about the babies. Now, let's go to the adults because this is about the danger of not maturing. I would like to explain why some adult Christians don't survive. And this is strange, but I'm going to give you the same reason. They associate their physical maturity with their spiritual maturity. They think because they are adults chronologically, they are adults spiritually. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. And I suggest earlier that the babies were trying to eat too solid a food, but in this suggestion, the Bible will suggest they're eating the wrong food. Hebrews 5, verse 12 to 14. The writer says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of what together? Full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, the Bible is saying, if you had a child, let me use an analogy. If you, if you took your child to kindergarten and, and they were behaving the same way in fourth grade as they were in kindergarten, you'd say something's wrong. In the very same way, if Christians that have been around a long time like this text is suggestion, 
It's coming to church. I'd have a hard time, but you got to get the picture. If a church member comes to church, he's 6'2", nice suit, and he takes out a baby bottle and starts drinking it. I'm sure that one of the elders would say, Pastor, I think one of our members have just flipped out. He's drinking a baby bottle in church. Well, that's a spiritual analogy to simply say there are some members that are like that. They don't drink the baby bottle, but they're not past the milk yet. Because during the week, they don't have any established study life. They don't have a way to get their lives stronger than where they were 15 years ago. And they say, well, I've been an Adventist for X amount of years. But if you boast that, at least there should be some external and spiritual evidence that you are stronger now than you were when you first gave your life to the Lord. Amen? Let me give you some analogies to let you know that they're not growing yet. Adult Christians should not behave irresponsibly like babies. When they're behaving like that, they ain't growing. Adult Christians should stop talking gibberish like babies. Have you ever seen babies? They could talk all day long and you have no clue what they're saying. There's some, there's some Christians that way all day long. About other folk, about themselves. They're griping about the economy. They don't have enough money. The car just broke down all day long. Gibberish. Because they have no connection to Christ to strengthen their faith. Therefore, stuff comes out that doesn't make sense to an adult Christian. Adult Christians should not whine when things don't go their way like baby Christians. Adult Christians should stop throwing tantrums to manipulate folk. <laughs> adult Christians, you got to wrap your head around this, should stop leaving a mess for other people to clean up. There's a spiritual connection there. Amen, somebody. And the same scripture applies. Here it is again. It's not a duplicate, but it applies right here. When I was a child... I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Adult Christians should learn how to feed themselves. Can the church say amen? You know, you cannot, this thing called Christianity requires more of us than just showing up. If we show up, than just being in the building, if we are in the building, than just spending a thoughtful hour a week in corporate worship, it requires this day-by-day -day diet for us to grow and for us to survive. You know, I think about that, this thing that a thought came to my mind and I kind of had to laugh it away, but it just came back, so I got to share it with you. I laughed it away earlier, but it just came to my mind. Christians that, um, Christians that try to get their nourishment, you know, spiritual nourishment only through sermons that are preached on television. Now, mind you, it's a great thing. Don't change your channel because you're not near 3ABN. But Christians that settle for only watching Christian programming on television when they are close enough to go and be in the audience, I suggest to them that during the week they need to watch the Food Channel to get their nourishment. I know you catch, I know you catch on somewhere. You could look at a hamburger all day long on television, but you ain't going to get no nourishment. Amen, English teacher. You're not going to get any nourishment. One night, my friend and I were sitting, this is a long years ago, and I was still eating Big Macs and all that other stuff. Well, 11.30, we were watching his little 13-inch Sony Trinitron. Remember that? Anybody? Help me out. 13-inch color Sony Trinitron. There we are sitting in our small room, just came back from riding our bikes, and this picture of a, a Whopper showed up on the screen. And they filled that whole 13-inch screen with the picture of this Whopper. It was 11.30 at night. He said, let's go to Burger King. And we got up and drove around Brooklyn looking for Burger King. We ended up going like seven miles because that thing looked so good, we had to satisfy our appetite. And I suggest to you the very same way. If you spend your time looking in God's Word, you will not be able to satisfy your appetite until you find a place where you can have a personal connection and taste how sweet God's Word really is. Got to learn how to feed ourselves. We should not be as scripturally ignorant as babies are. Ephesians 4. Let me move a little quicker now. Ephesians 4, verse 14 to 15. Notice what the Bible says. That we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. When you're immature, any new teaching will pull you out by the trickery of men in their in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, and the head is who, church? Christ. 
You show me a Christian that is weak, and I'll show you someone that does not study. Honestly, you can't study God's Word and walk away weak. It's not possible because His Word is living. His Word is powerful. It's filled with nourishment. You can't study this book and walk away weak. You show me a person, a Christian with no faith, and I'll show you somebody who does not pray. Studying God's Word will give you a prayer life. Studying God's Word will strengthen your faith. You don't have to worry about being weak. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, notice what he says. And then we're going to wind up with the six guidelines to facilitate maturity. Here it is. He says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In other words, in, all, in the old life, be a babe, but in the new life, be mature. Sometimes kids ask me, have you heard this song before? And I say, who's that by? And they mention an artist, and I say, I've never heard of their name. And I say, is that a Christian artist? They say, no. I say, well, I'm glad I don't know their name. Help me out, somebody. I, I'm always concerned about people that know all these worldly songs. I'm saying, what are you listening to? They're always mentioning this newest movie that came out. This person that just, what are you listening to? But let's go fast now. Scott, the guidelines to facilitate growth. Are you ready, Will? Here we go. Study God's Word. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Say that with me. Study God's Word. Say that. Study God's Word. The reason is clear. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15. What does study bring? It brings wisdom. Paul says, and that from childhood... You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Study God's Word, and your wisdom will increase. You will be wiser than you were before. Dr. Ben Carson says the reason why he has grown so intellectually is he, was, he studied Proverbs. He read Proverbs every day when he was growing up. You can't read a wise book and not become wise. The other reason that you should study your Bible, Romans 10, verse 17, it increases your faith. Here it is. Faith, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You cannot study God's Word and not have a faith that's going to increase. That's the first thing, study God's Word. Second thing, live out the truth. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16, live out the truth. Pray, Lord, give me strength to live it out. Here's what he says. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them when you know what's right. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Not just hearing you, but they're going to look at your life and say, Emma Lou, look at the way Emma Lou is living. I wonder what's different about Emma Lou. Been going to church a lot lately, been studying my Bible. No wonder. Amen. You can't have a life that you're living out your convictions and not show some external evidences. Third thing, walk in the truth. 3 John 1, verse 4. Notice what the Bible says. You want to make the Lord happy, here is what you do. I have no greater joy, Jesus says, than to hear that my children together walk in truth. Don't just say, I believe the truth. Walk in it. If you believe the Sabbath, walk in it. If you believe the things that the Bible are teaching, live them out. Let them reflect in your life. Because a person that's a pilot that's never flown is not really a pilot. The fourth thing, don't miss opportunities for corporate worship. Hebrews 10, verse 25. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, I put many, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know what? If you know the plane is going to be landing soon and people are going to get on board, don't meander by the restaurant because they'll come and leave you. What is being said in this scripture is if you know that the Lord is coming soon, we ought to be assembling together every opportunity that is given to worship corporately. And the fifth reason, share your faith. Hebrews 13 and verse 16. I love this verse. Not one that I've discovered too much before, but it fits right here. But do not forget to do good and to share. Whatever the Lord gives you, share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. When you share what God has given to you, God is well pleased. You know what? I wish I could see the Lord from heaven saying, come on, come on, give him a track. Give him a track. Give him a track. Oh, great. 
He just gave him a track. Now I got a chance to get to his heart. Amen. We were at some Chinese restaurant, P.F. Chang's in, in St. Louis, and we were talking to the young man that came to wait our table. And uh, he asked what we did, and we said, we just got back from where we got back from. We told him, he said, what do you do? I, well, I'm a pastor. I teach. I preach. Really? What church? And I told him all that. My wife said, go get some tracks. So I ran to the car and got two tracks and came back. And when he brought the bill, I put it in there with a nice tip. You know, you got to pay them to read that track with a nice tip and gave it to here. Here's my card, 3ABN. Go to that website. And here's another one, amazingfacts.org. Amen, amazing facts. But you got to plant those seeds. You got to share your faith. When you do that, I like this text, but do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Oh, they shared their faith with somebody else. You don't got to preach a whole sermon. Just give them something to read. And finally, the sixth thing we must do so that we will mature is watch and pray. Luke 21, verse 36. Here's what the Bible says. And I want us all to read this together. Are you ready? Here we go. Watch, therefore, and do what else, church? Pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch and pray. Share your faith. Don't miss opportunities for corporate worship. Walk in truth. Live out the truth. Study God's Word. These guidelines apply to your life. I tell you, I love baseball, but I haven't played baseball in years. I like basketball. Sometimes I play it too much. But whatever a person is convicted by, whatever a person has living in his or her heart is going to be a part of their daily activity. You want to find out a person that loves computers? Listen to their conversation. They talk about computers. People that like digital phones, listen to their conversation. They talk about the next new phone coming out. Have you heard about the iPhone 6 and the new Samsung? They talk that kind of language. If you want to find a Christian, I would suggest to you that if it's in here, it's going to come out because out of the abundance of the heart, come on now, the mouth speaks. If you want to mature, get it in here, and it's going to come out here. You don't have to force a tree to grow. If it's connected, it's going to grow. Amen, somebody? If you get connected to Christ, that's the first step in defeating your immaturity. Get connected. Study your word. Live out the truth. Walk in truth. Don't miss opportunities for corporate worship. Share your faith and watch and pray. And when you do that, you'll come to church and you'll see a change in people's lives. But even more than seeing change in other people's lives, it is God's desire that each one of us reflect to the world a change in our lives. Is Jesus coming soon, church? Amen. If you want to get ready for the coming of the Lord, get busy today. God bless you. Let us pray.